The New York Islanders have prospects all over the place. So what I've done is I boiled them all down and pulled out a top five. So who are they? Of course, hit that subscribe button. Don't miss a video. Also, head over to Twitter and follow at TLO Mitch. That's me. Don't miss any breaking information about Islanders prospects I haven't yet covered on the channel. So like I said, the Islanders, just like every other NHL team, have prospects everywhere. Russia, Sweden, Finland, the OHL, QMJHL, WHL, college hockey. They're everywhere. How do we rank them based off of those various levels of play? Well, I've used NHLE, just like a bunch of other people, I've used NHLE to essentially decipher how much a point, one point at those various levels, translates to the NHL. And based off of that, we can essentially establish what their potential is at the NHL level, and then kind of start ranking them based off of how productive we think they could be at the NHL level as of today. Now, I started doing that last year, and I had rankings based off of that and that alone. But the problem that I had last year is I just kind of lumped it all together. What, what I mean by that is I took that player's entire career leading up to that point and just boiled it down and said, this is how productive they could be at the NHL level. But that's not really how it works, right? Like, it's, that's unfair to players who haven't been around that long, which is why guys like Parker Wertherspoon ranked so high in my rankings previously. With no disrespect to Parker Wertherspoon, he's not a top five prospect in the Islander system. Good NHL defenseman, but not, sorry, good AHL defenseman, but not really an NHL caliber player. So why does he rank in the top? I think he was even in the top five. That's not right. So I've changed it this year. I'm going based off of growth to show who is growing at a faster rate than everyone else, because that's really what matters, right? It shouldn't be, this is what you've done. Now you are the best. It's how are they progressing? Because that's the point of prospects. They have to progress to a point where they become viable NHL players. So I've ranked them based off of that. Now, there are some pitfalls and there are issues with that type of ranking. And I'll get to that at the end. Now, I'm not just going to show you the top five. I'll show you the full top ten to essentially show you how my rankings uh, sit right now and where some of the issues are that we'll get to at the end of the video. We'll talk about the top five individually, but I really want to give you an extra peek behind the curtain to show you a, a better sense of what my ranking has and what my rankings look like. So here's the top ten. Jeffries, Bodzik, Berg, Ishkakov, Tsufo, top five. Newkirk, Salo, Van Isopel, Adams, Zurando rounding out the top ten. Now you look at that ranking and you're saying, that's not what I imagined it to be. And you're right. Same thing here. When I look at that ranking, I go, why is Alex Jeffries at the top? Cameron Berg was just picked up in the fourth round. Is he really the third best in the fourth round this year? That's rough. What is Mitchell Van Isopel doing there? And why is Robin Salo so low? So again, this is a very early look at rankings, and I'm going to toy and adjust them as the season progresses. Uh, hopefully I have something a little bit more rock solid when puck drops for the regular season. But as it stands now, this is a good early look at it, and we can all kind of grow with these rankings and see how they progress leading up to the season and during the season. So let's talk about these top five and why they ended up where they are. The first prospect on the list is Alex Jeffries, a fourth round pick from 2020. Uh, I based my rankings on growth. And as you can see with Alex Jeffries, his growth skyrockets last year. Bursts out of like out of nowhere effectively. He puts up an extra 8.31 of NHLE. So that's he's putting on an extra 8.3 NHL points from his draft year when he's playing prep league hockey to the NCAA. But you'll see here, there's a 12-game sample size. That's not a lot. So that's something that we have to figure out, or I'm going to have to figure out in my rankings going forward. Because a player like this, while that is a great year, and that shows great promise, he should not skyrocket to the top of the rankings because he has a really strong, short sample size year. That shouldn't really put him near the top. So that's adjustment number one to my, to my ranking, and you'll see that a little bit lower. The second player on the list, Samuel Bolduc. Now, this one probably sounds right to you. The last year, or the year he had in 2021 was phenomenal. His first pro year playing with the Bridgeport, then Sound Tigers, 
was incredible. Now, the sample size isn't great, 24 games, but still, he put up 14 points at the AHL level. You can see his NHLE skyrocketed by an extra 12 points to an 18-point defenseman as it stands today. He rounded up to 19, right? 18.61. That's how good his year was. I have no problems having him at number two. No problems at all. Number three is Cameron Berg. Now, again, this kind of falls in the Alex Jeffries category, where he was just drafted this year in the fourth round, but he had a really good year last year, right? 58 points in 51 games at the USHL level. And his NHL jumped by 4.6 extra points. That's great. But you'll also notice that there's only two years that I'm capturing here, which is another fault of this system. I'm only looking at draft year minus one, draft year, and the draft year up to the fourth. So, like, I, I don't think it's right that he jumps to the third because I'm only looking at two years of his production. That's not right. So I think one of the adjustments I'm going to make is I'm going to look at the last four years of production for anyone. So that means for Cameron Berg here, the two years previous to his draft minus one year. And I think that helps round it out because that should bring down his score a little bit to reflect the lower level of play that he was at. Number four is Ruslan Ishkakov. And this is another player where I have no problem having him where he is. Number four in the rankings makes sense to me. His last year in Finland was incredible, astronomical. He went up 50. 15 points of his NHL league. He's now at least a 26 point player at the NHL level using just translation factors. He could probably even do more than that. I, I think he could. That he had a huge jump, right? Considering that he flatlined at the NCAA, right? Exact same production line 21 points in 32 games across the both seasons. I know that looks like a copy paste error, but it really isn't. Look it up. His two years at UConn, exact same production line. Then he goes to Finland and he explodes, explodes. It took him a little bit. He had to learn a little bit more uh, the defensive game. But when he figured it out, he went from a third line center on the second best team in the league. I'm calling them second best. I think they finished actually third in terms of points either way to their second line center and arguably their first center. He was incredible for them, which reflects in his NHLE here. I keep pointing to my third monitor is why I look, you know, on the other side here. But an increase of 15 points is wild. I think he should be at least top three in the Islander system, but four is fine for now. I'm sure once I regulate for the Alex Jeffries and the Cameron Bergs, he jumps up. I'm sure of it. The fifth and final prospect we're looking at here is William Zafol. And I'm kind of surprised he finished in the top five. I honestly thought Robin Sala would, uh, but that's probably due to Alex Jeffries and Cameron Berg being in that top five as to why Robin Sala didn't make it. But William Zafol is an interesting case because he keeps growing, right? When you look at his growth right here, he added five points in his draft year to what he did his draft minus one year, and he added another three points last year. That is consistent growth year over year. And this year should even be a better year. They're projecting him to be a 40 goal scorer. The sample size should be larger than his 23 games he played. But still, the production should be there for him this year. And I expect growth once again. Now remember, he's a fifth round pick. Fifth. He went in the fifth round two years ago. This could be found money for the Islanders. Now I don't expect that once I make the next round of adjustments, he'll be in the top five. But he won't be far off. So going forward, some of the adjustments that I have to make are the Alex Jeffries and the Cameron Bergs. It's not that I have to nerf them specifically, but I have to find a way to nerf what is inflating their score, right? For Alex Jeffries, it's very low sample size. Um, and for Cameron Jeff uh, Cameron Berg, it's basically the same thing, only he's only got two years of data that I'm looking at. So I've got to increase the amount of data that I'm looking at for everyone, make it fair, so the last four years, I, and I can't, I have to factor sample size into that. So for 10 games or 12 games like Alex Jeffries, I've got to find a way to navigate that. I think the four year uh, window is really going to fix it. But if it doesn't, I have to look at something else. So that's my first look at the Islanders top five prospects. Again, this is going to evolve as we go forward into the regular season and throughout. These will move. As, per, as these players put up points through the regular season. But I wanted to give you a look at what I'm doing and how it's progressing 
as we get ready for the 21-22 season. If you like that video, hit the subscribe button. Don't miss another one. If you've already hit the subscribe button, thank you, thank you, thank you.